Oh, I have no idea who I am. <laughs> I'm almost certain I'm an alien. I, I look at the universe and, and I count, uh, thanks to the scientists, billions of galaxies, billions of stars in each galaxy, and here we are spinning around on this planet, and I'm thankful that I get to do what I do. I was taking in images for all those years, but never producing any art myself. I was around museum quality art, and I was handling famous paintings, and yet there was no time for me to turn those images or that knowledge into a product myself, because I was too busy with running my business and raising a family. And when I moved away from my home to run the gilding department for Sotheby's, all of a sudden I had free time for the first time in my career. They started work at 7.30 and finished work at 4.30. It was like, that's a half a day for me. And I, I either learned to play golf or I started drawing and painting. I had no excuse. And the, the choice was art. And I thought the first drawing was going to hurt. I thought it would be painful to restart after 23 years. And I bought pastels and black paper and I started drawing and it didn't hurt. It made me happy. And I made a vow that that's my message. I'm happy when I'm painting. And if I'm ever not happy when I'm painting, I put down the brush. That period was during preparation for my first solo show in Brooklyn. And I was working full time for Julius Lowy Frame and Restoring Company as the head of the gilding department. And so my job was very demanding. And yet I had a solo show coming up. And every morning I woke up with this smile on my face because my dream was finally coming true. And I had ideas come in hourly about other work besides the work I was trying to get ready for the show. Just, it was the most creative six months I've ever experienced. And I was doing rubbings on Tyvek of textured surfaces with litho crayon, street manhole covers, rock faces in parks, all kinds of textures. And I had moving paintings for the body, the main body of the show, and I had two rooms to fill, so I did all these additional pieces, and those paintings were part of that. And I selected 16 out of, oh, probably 25 to put in the actual moving painting, and then others were selected to just hang by themselves. But every one was like a magical adventure because I never knew what it was going to turn into. I would take the, the initial texture and do a rubbing, rotate the paper so that the composition constantly varied. I was trying to keep it organic because all of my work is based on my belief that nature is the only totally valid source for design, form, and color. When I submitted that painting to a mathematical and art exhibition, many of the artists worked with fractals, and I learned a lot about it. And the exhibition was in Finland, and I took myself and the painting there, and I was the only one that did not speak math. But I was okay defending my, my you know, appreciation of it. It just, I didn't speak the language. And there were some incredible works of art where 
people had the mathematical foundation and they used art to express it as opposed to me taking my painting and it turns out to be mathematical. <laughs> I came from the opposite. My concern has always been to try to convince the viewer to look at every part of the painting because I had to look at every part of the painting to make it successful and to satisfy my creative need. And it's so easy for someone to decide on a quick glance whether to move on or to keep looking. And I've found that by involving language in the title of the painting, I can generate a curiosity. And in one case, a painting is titled Cheeseburger with Everything. And there's an empty bun. And as soon as I say that title, they point to the bun and say, there it is. And I say, excuse me, that's a bun. And then they're annoyed and they look at every corner of the painting for the cheeseburger. And there's no burger. But I've succeeded. I've caused them to look at the whole surface. I enjoy that.